Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Can you, can you preach on Wednesday night? Uh, yes. You know, uh, what are we going to say? No. <laughs> you know? And so, but then I started, you know, getting with God, and I'm trying to figure out what exactly I want to preach. And... Well, that was my problem right there. It's not what I want to preach. It's what does God want me to preach. And I just got the words, go back to your mandate. And I started thinking about that for a minute, and I was like, you know, I haven't preached on faith my entire time of being in the ministry. And, you know, there's been aspects of it that have um, come out during other sermons and stuff, but actually teaching on faith I've never done. And that's pretty bad for a Rama Bible Training College graduate, Right. And I started thinking again in our pastor's labs, you know, um, during your second year, you have to preach twice. And in those labs, I think only one person ever taught on faith. And so it kind of got me thinking that maybe, you know, like, I guess thinking about it, you know, a lot of people who were in my class were second, third generation Rhema grads. You know, they were coming through and they probably heard the message of faith so many times they got tired of it. Well, you know, Brother Hagin's mandate from God was go teach my people faith. And when he started Raymond Bible Training College, that mandate passed on to everybody who went through those doors. And so that's something that cannot be lost in this generation. It has to be always, always taught because it was handed down to us. Amen. But not only that, but whenever you're in this church and you're under a pastor who's preaching faith, that mandate passes to you as well. And so it's not just the ministry gifts who are required to teach your people faith. It's everybody in the church who is under that mandate. And so I'm going to be preaching on faith. Um, I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, I've got a few pages of notes here that I might not even get through tonight. But next time I preach, I'll just continue where I left off, and we'll just keep going until I hear different. Um, so turn over to Mark chapter 11. Start in verse 23. Actually, 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. And we know from you know, margin and board studies that that actually means have the God faith, the God kind of faith. Verse 23. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. You know, a lot of people you know, would always laugh every time Brother Hagin got up on stage and said, and I'll turn over to Mark chapter 11. You know, everybody knew what was coming, but that was his mandate. That was what God told him to do. And this was the verse that got him off of the bed of sickness. It got him healed when he was a young boy at age, uh, I believe, 17. And so there's a lot of truth in the faith message. You know, it's not just something that we do because, you know, we want something from God. It's a lifestyle we live so that we can receive from God, yes, but so we can show it to other people so that they can be free and not have to live in bondage anymore, whatever that bondage is, whether it's sickness, whether it's poverty, uh, whether it's um, depression, anything like that. You can be free from anything like that by having faith in God. So we'll start, uh, go over to Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 6, we see, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if we don't have faith, we can't please God. That tells me that two things, that we can be without faith, and that God will be displeased if we don't have faith. So then we start asking, well, how do we get faith? Well, Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Or as Brother Hagin would say, faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, on and on and on. So we cannot discount the word in our lives. You know, the word is, cannot be a secondary thing in our lives. It has to be the foundation for everything that we do. Because it's only through that that we have the faith to receive anything from God. 
Um, Second Peter, chapter one. Uh, start off in verse sixteen. Well, let me preface this real quick before I get into this. Um, Peter, obviously, was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Um, the disciples were the ones who carried on the message after Jesus had been crucified. Uh, they went into the upper room with others and received the Holy Spirit, and they went out preaching like crazy. Um, you know, it was an amazing story about, well, really, 11 of the original 12, because Judas, obviously, uh, betrayed Jesus. But how these 11 men who walked with Jesus for but three, three and a half years, received all the knowledge from him and all the wisdom and went out and changed the entire world from just these men. And they saw some amazing things under Jesus. You know, they saw the sick being healed. They saw, you know, lepers being cleansed. They saw the woman with the issue of blood all of a sudden being healed. They saw Jesus turn loaves and fish into a meal and a feast for thousands. You know, this was, they saw amazing things. But probably one of the most amazing things I think they would have seen was when they went up on the mount and Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. And it was only three of them that went up with him. It was Peter, John, and, um, wow, I just lost it. James? They were like the inner three of the um, disciples. And so they went up with Jesus and they went up and they saw Jesus transfigured, you know, to light. And then they saw the prophet Elijah and they saw Moses. And they heard a voice from heaven say, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And they heard the voice of God say these things, and they were the witnesses to these things. But then you got Peter, years after this experience, writing here in uh, Second Peter, he says, "For we did not follow cunningly, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory." When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word concern, confirmed, which you will, and so we have the prophetic word concerned, which you will do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Well, chapter 19, and my margin, it says at the beginning, we also have a more sure prophetic word. Peter does not discount the, the, the things that he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, but he does say that it was a confirmation of the word that was already there. So he valued the word more than he valued a vision. He valued the word more than he valued an actual word from God, because the word is that everlasting thing. You know, Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God is everlasting. No matter what happens, this will always be true. This will always be the word of God, and it will never fade. And so if Peter, having walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, saw the miracles, still discount, not, I don't want to say discounted because he honored those things, but if he put the word above those things that he actually saw, that says something about how it needs to be in our lives. It needs to be the foundation of our lives, the foundation of everything that we do. Before we do anything, we need to find out if it's okay with the word, if it's okay with God's word. Because we've seen people get off so many times because they received a word from God that was not biblical, that was not, you know, anything that was backed up by Scripture. That's where this whole grace message has come from. You know, you can do anything you want, and, you know, you just sit on, sit on your duff, and, you know, God will bless you no matter what you do, and you can sin, you can do this, you can fornicate, whatever, and that's not true. And we'll see later on how... Holiness works into faith, but you know we just know that the word is should be the ground in everything. Even Brother Hagen, whenever he saw a vision, when he saw Jesus standing before him, and he told him that he had authority, he said, oh, "I'm gonna need you to show me that in the word." You know, he said, I need to see it at least three times because out of the witness or out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, the word is confirmed. So he says, "I'm gonna need at least three, three scriptures." He said, "I'll do you one better. I'll give you four. And so, you know, some people say, "Well, that's kind of..." You know, you're seeing Jesus, that's kind of, you know, rude or whatever to, to want to, you know, his word to be confirmed, but that's not the case because God wants us to live by this word. And so that's, I guess, all I have to say about that. <laughs> um, back to Hebrews 
chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we have the definition of biblical faith here. Um, and before I get into, like I said, this, this is just a fraction of what I, I want to get into as I'm, you know, preparing these lessons and everything, but I want to talk about what faith is not before I talk about what faith is. You know, there's a lot of times we get the idea that we know what faith is and we're doing wrong. We're, we're not doing, we're not following the biblical faith outline. And so the first thing that faith is not is it is not an isolated spiritual force. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, get there. Um, Verse 13. It says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believed and therefore speak. So we see that faith is a spiritual force. It is not something that we, you know, our natural bodies understand. It's not something that our, our soul can really even understand. It's something from the spirit. Because God has given to each man the measure of faith. And that can only happen when you're born again. And that can only happen whenever your spirit is reborn and God can put that faith inside of you. You know, um, unbelievers, the only faith that they can get is just enough to confess Jesus as Lord. And that's all they need. They confess Jesus as Lord, and then God gives them the measure of faith, the Holy Spirit, and then they can begin to build their faith in other areas. You know, I, I, a friend of mine was always trying to talk to unbelievers about being filled with the Holy Ghost and, and getting healed and the finances, you know, and all that other stuff. And finally, I just told him, I was like, look, they don't have, they, they can't understand, they can't grasp that. Because unless you have the Holy Spirit in your life, this is just a book. It really is. I mean, it is the book of life. It is the everlasting word. It is the thing that will get you through anything unless you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's just pages. And it means nothing. Because I remember when I wasn't saved, I looked at this and I thought, this is ridiculous. I don't understand this. How do people take what's inside here and whatever, you know. But once you're filled with the Holy Spirit and the eyes of your understanding are enlightened by the Holy Spirit, this becomes alive and is never, ever, ever irrelevant. It is as relevant today as it was when it was written 6,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. And so, um, where was I? <laughs> Um, so yes, faith is a spiritual force. You have to be born again to understand it, but it's not the only thing that is in our lives. We can't just have faith and, you know, believe that everything's going to be all right because we see, um, you know, there are other spiritual aspects that work along with faith in order for us to build our faith. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verse, verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And so we see one of the aspects that we have to have in order for our faith to work is love. You know, our love walk is paramount in what we do. Um, and so we know that the... Uh, hold on. Go ahead and go over to Mark 11 while we're doing this. But, you know, love is, is that very important aspect you know, everything works through love, really, um, because without the love of God, we wouldn't be where we are today. Without um, the love that he shed abroad in our hearts, we couldn't, we'd live life of, with bitterness and, and unforgiveness. And then Mark 11, you know, we just read that, you know, we have the, we, we're told to have the God kind of faith, you know, to, to move mountains. You know, the God kind of faith, if you look back in Genesis 1, is God, you know, just sitting and just decides, you know, I want light. So he says, light be, and there was light. It wasn't, you know, I, I can't imagine God sitting there wringing his hands wondering, uh, if I say this, if I, if I want this to happen, is it going to happen? No. He knew whenever he spoke, whatever words came out of his mouth was going to happen. And so that's the kind of faith that we're supposed to have. And so he, Jesus tells us how to get that. You know, we believe, we confess, we move mountains. But oftentimes we neglect the verses right after that. In, 20, in verse 25, he says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you and your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And so, you know, Brother Hagin was one of those people who, you know, if, 
anybody came up to him and said, you know, I'm believing God for this and it's just not happening. I don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, I, I've confessed the word. I've read the word. I, I've gotten into it. He said, the first thing you need to check up on, if, if all these other things aren't working, is your love walk. Are you walking in love towards everyone around you? And I'm not talking about the lovey-dovey, I, for, you know, I, I uh, accept your lifestyle. Uh, you can do whatever you want. No, I'm talking about biblical love, where you ha actually have a genuine love for somebody. Not, you know, not being unforgiving. You know, for unforgiveness has always been explained to me as drinking a poison and expecting the other person to die. It just doesn't work like that. If, you, if you're walking in unforgiveness, you're only hurting yourself. And it's not right to be walking in bitterness towards people. You know, God wants us to love. And even if somebody has hurt you, you know, God can heal that. You know, and only God can really heal it completely. And so, you know, forgiveness is, it, it, it's really paramount in anything because it, it, will, it will literally eat you up inside and it can lead you to an early grave. You know, people don't understand the power of forgiveness. And it's not necessarily for them, it's for you. But God's word commands us to forgive, and so we must do that in order for our faith to work, in order for everything else in the word of God to work for us. Um, let's see. Let's say, if you're living with bitterness towards someone or refuse to forgive your faith, refuse to forgive, your faith will be short-circuited. That's one thing we don't want to do. You know, we don't want to get to a point where we're not allowing God to work through us. And you know, any of these things that you know, I'm talking about, like unforgiveness or bitterness, you know, those are things that can short circuit your faith. You know, walking in love all right, is respecting your pastor, is respecting those people who are, have authority over you. Um, and not just, you know, it's honoring them. It, it, it's, it's noting the, the, the place in their life. You know, I have a unique situation because my pastor is my father-in-law. And so I'm very familiar with my pastor. We go over to dinner every Sunday. We, you know, there's other times that we do stuff together. So I become very familiar with him. Well, familiar, familiar, familiarity <laughs> can breed, you know, complacency. Can, can you start seeing things in people that you don't see when they're just preaching up here and you're out the congregation, you know? And it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying pastor's a bad person. You just see little things, you know, and 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 you start thinking, you know. Oh, you know, he's just, you know, he's my father-in-law. I don't have, you know, blah, blah, blah. But no, that's not, that's not the case. I still have to honor and respect him. And I do. And I have to, I find myself slipping up sometimes. You know, and a lot of times Jess will correct me. <laughs> she'll, she'll be like, hey, you need to kind of watch, you know. And so, you know, I don't refer to him as Ed. He's pastor. He's my pastor. Because that's the, that's the position he's been given in my life as my pastor. You know, Miss Janie is not... Janie, it's Miss Janie, Miss Taylor, you know, those are, the, and I remember uh, there was a guy in uh, my previous church, um, my, my pastor's name was Craig Teddy, and he's the regional director now for RMAI in Oklahoma, yeah, but he was the district director at the time, and um, there's somebody in the church that just refused to call him pastor, <laughs> you know, he's like, ah, oh, Craig, you know, blah, 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 you know, just, and, and that just, I was new in the things of God, but that just, it just, like when I heard that, it just ground, like teeth grinding. It's what had, oh, it made me feel because you know I also came from the military where you know you don't call people by the first name unless you're friends with them outside of work, same rank, that sort of thing. You know, it's chief, it's sir, it's commander, it's you know. So that kind of respect was was you know put into me, and I couldn't break it. <laughs> no matter what, I couldn't do it. And so he was always Pastor Craig to me. He was always pa it was Pastor Dorothy. He was Pastor Craig, and you know. This man who refused to call him pastor had some issues in his life that he needed help with correcting. But since he dishonored him so much, he short-circuited his line to his pastor. And so when his pastor was trying to, to help him and to show him the things in the word that would help his situation, he wouldn't listen to him because he didn't respect him. You know, you don't, you know like my kids will not call people in the church by their first name. I'm sorry, they just won't do it. It'll be Miss, you know, Ellie. It'll be Mr. Dick. It'll be Mr. Jeff, Miss Melanie, because I want them to have that respect from a young age. You know, something I didn't have when I was growing up. I had to learn that real quick in the military. <laughs> you know, you get in there, you get around all these other people. The minute you lose that, 
you're, you're, you're toast. I mean, it's, it's bad. But I had to learn it real quick. And, you know, thank God that I joined the military. Because, that, you know, the, some of the things I learned, I may not have been saved while I was there, but some of the things I learned while I was there, I have been able to bring into my faith life. Some of the discipline, some of the respect, some of the honor, that sort of thing. And so um, I don't ever regret my military service. I loved it. And it paid for me to go to Rama. <laughs> you know? I mean, I served whenever I wasn't serving God. And all of a sudden, God tells me to go to Rama. You know? And I'm like, well, how am I going to pay for this? You know, it's $3,000 a year. I don't, you know, you can't get financial aid for it because, you know, it's not certified or whatever. But um, then I remembered, I got the GI Bill. <laughs> and so, you know, the, I, God used that too. It's still paying dividends, you know, it's paid for almost two degrees, plus my Rama, you know, it's, it's one of those, but, you know, besides that, you know, God I took a decision that I made and, and worked it out, let's put it that way, and, and that's how good God is, you know, you, you put your faith in him, it doesn't matter what mistakes you made in your life, he can work those out to his good and to his glory, because if you told me five years ago that I'd be here preaching in front of people, I'd have called you crazy. Because I wasn't living for God. I didn't want to have anything to do with God. I wanted to live my life. I wanted to drink. I wanted to um, do all those things. But, you know, praise God, you know, that he's good. And he'll, he'll snatch you out of his, any situation, and he'll put you where he wants you to be. So, anyways, sorry. <laughs> Go over to James chapter 1. <clears throat> Find it here. So we're talking about how faith is not an isolated uh, spiritual force, that there are other things that have to be um, added to our faith in order for it to work uh, to its full potential. Oh my goodness. Wow. There we go. All right. So we got James chapter 1, we'll start in verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, that's a verse that I hated when I first came to God. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials or temptations. Why do I have to count it joy? I don't, I don't want to count it joy, but that's, you know, that's the word of God, and, that, and that's faith right there. You have to do it by faith sometimes. Count it all joy because you know, God's going to work it out. It's going to happen. You know, and, and your test today will be your testimony tomorrow. Uh, that's something I had to fall back on a lot. Anyways, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So that's that, that really bad P word, patience. You know, faith cannot work without patience. Um, go over to Hebrews chapter 6. And we'll go to verse 12. Actually, 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then go over to Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. That means that's, you know, he's talking about patience and taking this whole armor of God and using it um, in a patient manner. But, you know, patience is not one of those things that we enjoy, especially in the world we live in today. You know, I can go to McDonald's. I can order a number two, two cheeseburgers. Fries, Dr. Pepper, I can order it, pay for it, have it in my belly within 10 minutes if I wanted to. You know, but it's so much better if I go home and I take that ground beef, that 80-20 mix. You know, you got to get a little bit of fat in there so you get the taste. You, you know, pound out those patties, you know, you put some salt and pepper on there, put some Worcestershire sauce and, 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 and sprinkle some of that, uh, oh, what is it, the, uh, I don't know, some kind of all seasoning that's just incredible. And if I throw that on the grill, and I cook that up, and it's going to take longer than 10 minutes, but it's going to taste so much better than that, you know, $5 McDonald's. Exactly. <laughs> It'll be real meat. And so patience, you know, a lot of times we want to make things happen. 
for God. Um, and that's not faith. You know, faith is speaking those things we know to be true and standing in it and keeping on that path until God's answer comes, not man's answer. Um, once again, my pastor is back, um, back in Oklahoma. When they were about to graduate from Rhema, see, their, their, whole, their whole plan was after they graduated Rhema, they went to the evangelist class. They're going to travel the world with an RV, go into RV parks, and have revivals in RV parks. That's what they wanted to do. And praise God, yeah, I can't do it. I can't live in an RV. <laughs> my parents have one. We took vacations in them, you know, and like a week in an RV, and I'm done. There's not enough space. There's, I mean, the shower is like this big, you know, it, it's, it's awful. That's what they wanted to do, and praise God, you know, that's, that was their vision. And so um, a lady came up to them and said, God wants me to give you $100,000 to start your ministry. That's, a, that's, you know, that's God, right? A lady comes up to you and says, I want to give you $100,000 to start your ministry. Yep, praise God, let's do it. Well, they had a check about it. You know, they've been believing God that they wanted to, you know, they, they were, they're going to be in ministry. They, they need to know what to do. And so $100,000 sounds really, really good, especially to a Rama grad or somebody who's about to graduate Rama, who's been living off of, you know, hot dogs and macaroni and cheese for two years and barely scraping by. That's a lot of money. Exactly. Rama noodles. I ate a lot of those. <laughs> but that's a lot of money. And that's, you know, that's got to be God's answer. I've suffered enough, you know. I have to have, this is, this is perfect. But they got that little check, you know, and, and praise God that they didn't take that money. They, did, they decided not to take the money because they, they, you know, something was telling them not to. Well, it turns out that this lady was, she was very rich, and she was giving people all this money to start churches and, and ministries around the world, but she was using that money to control them. You know, and then if she didn't get her way, she'd shut them down. Because she wouldn't give them the 100000 up, you know, up front. It would just be like, you know, as you do what I tell you to, Exactly. So, obviously, that wasn't God, right? However, once they did graduate Rama, a friend of them asked them to go to Mustang, Oklahoma, which is just west of Oklahoma City, and said, you know, I have a, uh, I have a little Bible study that I'm, I, I've started over there. He says, but I, I, for some reason, he couldn't do it for, like, the next few months. And he asked them to take over, and they said, well, we, you know, we don't have any other offers anywhere else. We're not going back home, and... Well, bless God, let's go. So they went to Mustang, Oklahoma, got this, you know, started, you know, with this Bible study, and 30 some odd years later, they got their church still in Mustang, Oklahoma. You know, and that's God. You're living out, you know, they're living out, you know, they live, had to live by faith, obviously, but they're living what God had wanted for them, not what they or somebody else could produce for them. And so patience is key because we may miss God if we're true you know, too heavy of, uh, or too fast at going somewhere. And, and you, you got a lot of people coming out of Bible school. And I understand it because when you come out of Bible school, you are stock cocked and ready to rock. I mean, you, you're singing that song at the end, you know, graduation, and I'll go never the same. You're like, yes, I'm going to go. I'm, gonna, I'm so, going to the hospital. I'm going to heal everybody, you know. But <laughs> patience, you know. Not everybody's called to just go immediately out of Rhema and go to the mission field or go pastor a church or go, you know, pioneer a church. Some people are. Some people did. There's people who are doing it now that we graduated with, and praise God. That's what they were called to do. That's what they're doing. They're spreading the message of faith somewhere where it's not being taught. But for me, and for Jessica, it was not that. It was to come home to her home, which is now my home, support the church, and, you know, take some, take some pressure off of, you know, some of the things, take, take some pressure off the pastor, you know, help him out and everything. And this is where we're supposed to be, and that's God. You know, had we rushed off and gone to the mission field, there's no telling. We could be dead right now. Because if you don't go in the right timing, it could cost you your life. It could cost you everything. It could cost you your children's life. It could, I mean, it's, we, we think of these things like, oh, well, God will get me out of the mess if I'm wrong. It, yeah, if you survive it, <laughs> you know. I mean, I can't. I can't go rob a bank and say, well, God will forgive me and God will you know, get me out of this mess once I, you know, everything's good. But if I get shot in the process of it and die, probably not going to be able to get me out of that. <laughs> you know? And we shouldn't be thinking that way anyway. But anyways. And so we know that, um, you know, patience and is paramount to everything with faith. You know, I always, well, let me give you this situation. If you were diagnosed with, let's say, cancer, 
Um, basically, you're going to die within a year. Doctor says, but I have this pill you can take. If you take it twice a day for six months, and you eat this exact diet that I tell you to eat, you will be completely cured of cancer in six months. Would you do it? Would you do it? Everybody do it, right? I mean, you want to be healthy. You want to, be, you want to live. You want to live for your kids. You want to live for your, your family and everything. So why, when we're believing God for, for healing, after three or four days do we give up? The natural remedy of taking two pills and following this diet, we're, we're more than willing to do that because we know it's going to work. Well, we should be more sure that God's word is going to work, that God is our healer, that God, you know, he, he, he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to be our healer. He sent Jesus to take our sin, take our sickness. We have a more sure word here than we ever had in a doctor. Doctors can be wrong. Now, I'm not discrediting medicine. We'll actually get into that here in a little bit. Um, I believe in medicine. I believe it's a good thing. I believe it's from God. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, 2 Peter 1. <clears throat> Start in verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So we see here that the first thing that Peter notes is that we have to add to our faith virtue. So he's telling us exactly right here that faith is not isolated. That we have to add to our faith. It's not just faith that's going to, you know, I mean, it's just faith that gets you into heaven. It really is because you have to have that faith to receive Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, but to that you're supposed to keep going. You're not supposed to stop at just, you know, and that, exactly. You're not supposed to stop at the conversion experience. You're supposed to keep going to live for God in the most, uh, you know, excellent way that you can. And so looking through here, you know, add to your faith virtue. Well, what's virtue? Excellence. You know, add to your faith excellence in everything that you do. Um, and that takes a lot of discipline to do. Because there's times where, you know, like, uh, I'm at work. Um, it's at the end of the day. There's something that needs to be cleaned up, but I really don't want to do it. You know, a lot of times, sometimes I don't do it. But I should, you know, I should be adding to everything I do excellence. And that goes to the Word of God and diligently studying the Word of God. You should be doing that with excellence, not just casually reading the Word here and there, but really studying it and getting it in down into your heart, making those deposits so that whenever the tough times come, you don't have to be scrambling, looking for, you know, what it's already in your heart, and you can speak it. Amen. And, it will, you know, it will come to pass, and you'll get through your circumstance. And so to virtue, we're supposed to add knowledge. Well, what's knowledge? Obviously, we know what knowledge is. It's learning. It's getting, you know, the Word of God inside of us. It's getting His love inside of us. You know, the knowledge of His love, the knowledge of these sort of things. So we're adding to our knowledge self-control. Uh, obviously, we know what self-control is. We don't like self-control. Like I said, if I go to McDonald's, I want the large meal. I want the big fries. I don't want the small ones. I want the big drink, not the small one. But self-control, you know, teaches us that, you know, that we have the discipline to not do the things that God's telling us not to do. And, you know, and it also takes the discipline, you know, the self-control to get into the Word and see what we're not supposed to do, to see what we are supposed to do. You know, we're all guilty of these things. I'm not, I'm not, obviously, I'm not preaching here saying that I'm perfect. I have perfect self-control. I have perfect discipline. No, I'm not. All right? I'm not even claiming that at all. It's always going to be a process. It's always going to, I don't want to say struggle because it shouldn't be. You know, it's, 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 it's easy when you're doing it with God, but it's not always going to be like, you know, cupcakes and fairy tales and everything because there will be times where you're going to have to dig in. It's going to be tough. But because you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you can do it. And you know, you, what makes it easy is knowing that you've already won the battle. You just have to put these practices into practice, or t these uh, principles into practice, thank you, and, you know, get it there. Okay, so we're adding um, knowledge, adding to our knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, which patience, which we just talked about. 
and to perseverance, godliness. Godliness is another word for holiness. It's another one of those curse words that we don't want to say because we have to do something about it. Now, holiness is very important to our faith. Um, without holiness, without being consecrated to God, without doing what he has told us to do, and without living a life um, you know, free, from, free from sin and all that sort of things, we will never be able to activate our faith. Because, you know, what does uh, John say in 1 John? He says, you know, if our heart condemns us not, then, you know, we can, basically, if our heart condemns us, we cannot receive from God. And so if you're not living a holy lifestyle, if you're doing things that God has told you not to do, your heart's going to condemn you. And so if your heart's condemning you, 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 you just shut off the valve to faith, basically. And so you've got to be cleansed of that. But luckily, 1 John 1, 9, you know, we have that. If you confess your sin, it's... Uh, Faithful to forgive you from all unrighteousness. No matter what anybody says, that's written to Christians. It's not. Uh, I don't want to get into that. It just angers me. Anyways. <clears throat> um, all right. So, so to godliness, we're to add brotherly kindness. Um, brotherly kindness is Philadelphia. It's the word Philadelphia, obviously. Uh, we know that to be love for the brethren. Um, you know, what you do in the church, how you interact with people is going to affect your faith. If you're constantly backbiting or bickering or talking, gossiping, that sort of thing, you're going to shut off, you know, the, the, um, the path to faith. Um, because, you know, think about it. What is backbiting? What is gossiping? It's really a form of pride because somebody's doing something that you don't see is right and you're exalting yourself above them because you're saying you're better than them by gossiping about them. Now, this is not, you know, going to judgment. Um, the pastors talked about this a lot, about judgment. You know, there is a righteous judgment. There's a judgment that we are supposed to have towards people of the faith. But we don't gossip about their shoes. Or we don't gossip about their, you know, <sighs> little petty things, you know. But if you have your mouth on people, you will lose... Um, your access to faith working. Um, and so, where am I at? I just lost it again. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so to our brotherly kindness was to add charity, which is love. And we talked about that earlier as well. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get through this, but I'm going to start it. All right, so we talked about faith is not a isolated uh, spiritual force. It works in conjunction with other things as we've seen. Um, we cannot just have faith and expect to receive from God. Um, but faith is not denial. That's our second point. Faith is not denial. Um, it does not deny the existence of a problem. Um, you know, sometimes we get the idea that if I have symptoms in my body, like, you know, if, if my nose is running, if, if I have a fever of 102, if I you know, coughing up every two seconds, if I just deny those symptoms, then I'm in faith. Well, that's not true, because the fact is you got a sickness in your body, okay? The fact is that you're not feeling well, that you need to get help, right? But the fact is that, but the truth is God is my healer. And I don't have to worry about these symptoms, because now that I know I have a problem, I know what I need to do to fix that problem. The same thing with, um, you know, with finances. If, if, you're, if you're broke, if you're not being able to pay your rent or pay your electric bill, you can't just deny it. Because if you deny it, you're going to get evicted. Your electric's going to get cut off. Um, you're going to be taking showers at the convenience store in the sink because you don't have any water. Okay? Denying the problem is not faith. Amen. Knowing what the answer to your problem is and knowing that that answer is God is faith and believing that he will take care of that. You know, uh, I, I can't, I, I, don't, I don't like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we had to take, when I worked at the rehab, we had to take our kids to AA meetings. And, you know, I, I'm glad they got people, you know, delivered from alcohol. But their methods are, I don't, I don't like it. Because, you know, you have to admit to a higher power that, you know, you're, you have a problem and, and all this other stuff. But the first step really is admitting you have a problem. 
And that's kind of how it goes along with faith. You know, you have to, you have to recognize there's a problem before you know how to fix it or before you can find out how to fix it. And Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, your higher power, I knew a guy whose higher power was his motorcycle. I'm like, that. So if you're driving down the road and you get in a wreck and your motorcycle's totaled and you'll never see it again, is that still your higher power? I just, I don't understand it. And, you know, people, I, I can't stand that when you first go to a meeting, it's, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. You know, no, praise God, I'm delivered. You know, I was an alcoholic for many years. And the minute I came to Jesus, he took that out of me. And, and it's been a battle of faith ever since. Right. You know, it's not something that you just taken away and it's done. I don't ever have to think about it again. No, there's times it comes up or I want to drink. But I know that God, you know, if I just turn my eyes to him and take that desire away, I don't have to worry about it. It's been five years in September. You know, praise God, you know. That's something I, I tried to do on my own so many times. and I couldn't do it. But the minute I accepted God and got filled with the Holy Ghost, it was gone. The desire was gone. You know, and that doesn't happen for everybody. I understand that, you know. But, you know, praise God it did. But and that's, what I'm, that's why I hate the, the, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Hello, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. No, I am delivered. I am no longer an alcoholic. I am a child of God. I no longer have to have that, that, that demon in my life, that spirit, whatever it is. I no longer have to have it because I am free. Praise God. So I'm not an alcoholic. I'm redeemed. You know, I'm, anyway, sorry. That's my little soapbox. But, um... Anyway, so we're talking about, you know, finances. You know, um, if you deny the problem, you're going to be out on the streets, right? And so what do you do? You know, well, first you admit, you know, not admit, you, you, you acknowledge that there is a problem. And then you start going to the Word and saying, okay, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, I, and you have to do things in the natural. What do I do in the natural? Well, I start cutting expenses. I start seeing things that I don't need to spend money. You, you start doing these things in the natural, and the supernatural will line up. You know, that's, what, that's one thing that we've, I think this generation, my generation of um, people coming into the faith movement is that we've lost the natural part of it. We think it's all spiritual. We think that all we have to do is believe God and, and have faith. Theirs is a false faith. Anyway, all we have to do is just do these you know, things and God's going to bless us no matter what because we are the righteousness. We are, there's nothing we can do. No, 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 no. Everything we do affects everything in the supernatural. You know, I was told once by my pastor, he said, do everything you know to do in the natural until something in, in the supernatural tells you to do something different. And that's a good advice, you know. If I'm broke, if I don't have any money, I don't need to spend it on these things that don't matter. I need to focus on budgeting and getting things right, right? So... Then the supernatural, if you're, if you're working, you know, James says, um, you know, faith without, faith without corresponding action is dead. It says faith without works is dead, but it essentially means faith without corresponding actions is dead. And so what we do in the natural, we have to, if we truly believe what we're saying, we truly believe, you know, our confession, we're going to act like it. And, and that's, you know, we'll get to that too, but I'm starting to get <laughs> ahead of myself. <laughs> But I guess the main thing is, and I'll finish up uh, next time on uh, faith is not denial. Um, yeah, because there's people who have something wrong in their bodies, and they refuse to get help for it. Um, I don't believe medicine is a sin. I believe every good and perfect, you know, every good thing comes from God, and medicine's a good thing. It keeps us alive. It keeps us going. Um, you know, I don't think the devil is promoting health clinics. <laughs> I don't think he's promoting doctors because he doesn't, you know, his, his whole MO is to steal, kill, and destroy. And medicine helps keep people alive. Granted, the better way is through God, looking to him as your healer and be completely restored without having to spend the money or the side effects or anything like that. But there's nothing wrong with medicine. If you're sick, go get help. If your faith is not there to believe God for it, and you'll know, Go to a doctor, do what he tells you to do, and do it until you have the faith to overcome it. The story I always think about is this, uh, the man that Brother Hagin knew with the diabetes. He had diabetes for years. Every day he had to have an insulin shot. And when he finally found out about you know, the Word of God, that I can believe God for my healing, he asked Brother Hagin, he says, so do I stop taking my insulin? Do I, you know, do I just believe God? And he said, 
he located him in his faith, and he said, no, I don't think you're at that point yet. He says, what you need to do is you need to, as you're taking your medicine, you say, God, I thank you for the healing. You know, it's affecting a healing and a cure in my body. And so every time he took that shot for years, he just believed God that, you know, he was healed. Well, he went to the doctor a few years, you know, a few months, a few years later. The doctor said, hold on, I'm going to run a few more tests. Ran some tests. His pancreas ran it perfectly. Never had to take insulin again, you know. Oral Roberts, probably the greatest, uh, one of the greatest healing uh, evangelists of, our, you know, of, the, of the modern faith movement, held tent revivals. People healed it left and right. What did he do? He started the City of Faith. There's a hospital for people so that they can you know, have state-of-the-art health care to get, to, to get better naturally, but teaching them the things of the Spirit to help that out. You know, there was, there was a, a set of praying hands in front of the uh, City of Faith for years. Um, now it's in, in front of Oral Roberts University. And I'm, when I say it's huge, I mean it's, it's massive. But it's in front of Oral Roberts University now. But his whole thing was, take the, you, know, you have the natural side of man here, the doctors, the medicine, everything, and you have the God side coming together to work healing. You know, and if one of the greatest, and I'll show you too um, next time, um, you know, Jesus <laughs> even committed the, the use of medicine. And I'll show you that uh, next time. So I'll give you something to look forward to. <laughs> so we're going to end there. Um, thank you guys for coming out. Um, it really is an honor to, to be able to speak in this, uh, in this church, um, to be able to be under such an amazing pastor, but also to be around just amazing people. You know, you guys have stuck through a lot. There's been a lot of, you know, things go, but, you know, your faithfulness will not go unrewarded. You know, being faithful no matter what, you know, that's, that's what God's looking for. And if you're faithful in the small things, then he'll start moving you on to bigger and better things. Amen? As long as we stay faithful as a church in the small things that we have right now, he's going to grow us. Amen? We're going to get to a point where this, this building won't even be able to contain it. We're going to get to a point where, you know, we're, we're, we're having to have two services every morning because there's so many people coming through, Right? Amen. So just be believing. You know, stay faithful. Be believing. You know, hook up with us in prayer. The right people are going to come in. That we're, you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking about church people. I'm talking about people who have never heard the word of faith. People who have never heard the gospel. We need to bring them in. Get them taught up in the word. Send some to Ramos so that they can go teach the, world, you know, the word of the world. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Um, Let's pray before we go. Father God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity that we've had. Lord, I thank you for each and every person in this building right now and each and every person in this church. I thank you, Lord, that they're blessed. According to your word, they are blessed. As they remain faithful in the small things, Lord, that you'll promote them into bigger and better things. Lord, as a church, we're growing. Even if it may not be physically in numbers, in the spirit, we call it to be right now in Jesus' name. That we will not be without lack. We're always receiving everything that we need. And God, I just thank you for our pastors. I thank you that they have been faithful over these many years and many trials to not waver. The Lord, that you've been able to, to give them the strength to continue because we need them in our lives. We need their authority. We need their, their wisdom and their guidance. I thank you so much for that. And we just love you and bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.